Welcome to the Atmosphere Church channel. On behalf of all of us here at Atmosphere, thank you for watching. We pray that this message will touch your heart and change your life. Regardless of what you believe, where you come from, or what questions you might have, you are welcome here. Our desire is to help lead you in experiencing God by following Jesus. If you want to find out more information about us, head over to our website at atmosphere.church. And don't forget to click below to subscribe. Enjoy the message. What's up, guys? Pastor Jim Cruz here, lead pastor of Atmosphere Church. And let me say once again, thank you for inviting us into your living room or from wherever you're watching. We are so grateful that you are a part of our church fam. Hey, if you're on Facebook Live or YouTube Live, you know the drill. We want to hear from you. We don't want you to just watch today's talk. We want to connect with you. And the best way we can connect with you is if you leave us a comment. So please type out today. Let's let's hear from you about how we could be praying for you. Maybe you're going Going through something, maybe a family member is going through something, just type out that prayer request and how we might be praying for you this week. We have a special guest speaker who has spoken at Atmosphere before. His name is Pastor Samuel Laws. He's one of the lead pastors up at a church in San Ramon, California called Brave Church. He pastors up there with his dad, Darren Laws. And both of these guys have been a huge blessing to Atmosphere Church. And we can't thank them enough for all of the ways that they have been a part of this entire movement that we've experienced over these last three years. So get those emojis going on Facebook, put those heart buttons out there, those like buttons, and give a warm atmosphere welcome to Pastor Samuel Laws. Take it away, Samuel. Hey, Atmosphere Church, Pastor Samuel here. Hey, so honored to be with you today. We are in person at all of the gatherings, but for online, Hey, I wanted to share this message with you that I recorded for you in San Ramon. And I just wanted to tee it up here and let you know how honored I am to get to share this word with you. I really believe it's going to encourage you and help you in an area, a key area that we all wrestle with, and that is worry and anxiety. There are gaps in all of our lives. And these gaps represent the distance between the life that we're living and the life that we want. The distance between our expectations and our experience. In some cases, it's the distance between our dreams and reality. So here's the truth. Though at times we may have some pretty strong and competing desires, when we decide to follow Jesus, we receive a stronger and deeper desire for good. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit that these deeper desires can win out and the gaps in our lives can be closed. Each week we'll be looking at a different biblical value whereby the power of the Holy Spirit and the strength of godly community, we can close the gaps. And so this is how we experience more of the life you want. Today we'll be in Matthew 6, starting in verse 25. If you want to go there, you can prepare to follow along. Um, This is one of my favorite passages. And towards the end, there's this verse that God has just spoken to me and used over and over again in my life. Um, It's a passage where Jesus tackles something that we all struggle with to some extent. In this passage, Jesus addresses worry, or what some of us might call anxiety, It's college application season, which has me thinking about when I was trying to decide what to do for school, uh, what to do with my life, which can really create some anxiety. It can really create some worry. Uh, School can be a hard thing to figure out because you have to make a big decision of where to go and what to study. It's like all of a sudden, this thing that you've been preparing for your whole life is upon you, and you can feel the weight of your future on your shoulders. Like, wow, high school's over, what's next? What am I gonna do with my life? And not only that, but you're about to commit tens of thousands of dollars to this decision, like maybe even take on debt. And so part of why this can be so stressful is it's almost impossible to have certainty of what you really wanna do at this point. So usually what we do is we consider, well, what am I passionate about? What what do I like to do? Or or what do other people say that I'm good at? Or what do my parents want me to do? Or God, what do you want me to do? College is the first big decision that we make as young adults. And not just where to go or what to study, but whether or not to go at all. 
See, some of the most successful entrepreneurs of our age didn't graduate college. And we know this because they built their companies and their legacies, where they were all birthed right here in our backyard in Silicon Valley. So if there was ever a place that viewed education differently, it's right here in the Bay. You can get a degree from Stanford, but if you don't have the skills for the job, it really doesn't amount to much. So we weigh our options and we wrestle with where to go and we wrestle with what to do. And in my case, I, I just started looking back at my childhood. I started looking back at things that I had done. Um, maybe you've done this. You kind of just start taking inventory of your past to try to figure out your future. And so one thing I noticed is that I liked business. Ever since I was a kid, I had some kind of side hustle going uh, in elementary school. After I drew my first comic book, I then turned it into a series, and the next thing you know, I'm selling these to my family. <laughs> then I started a snack bar at recess, and I sold candy to the other kids. The teacher shut that one down. I really should have given them a cut. Like, I don't know what I was thinking. But then I had this lawn mowing business, and I started doing yard work for my grandparents' neighbors, and I'd go around and get clients, and I'd go to their houses once a week and mow their lawn and pull their weeds. And, you know, it was really rewarding to see what hard work could bring in, but it was also just so fun to be building something. Alongside this growing passion for business, I also loved my church. I loved serving and I loved getting to help build the church. Over the years, I served everywhere. I mean, I, th I think I started out in kids ministry. Uh, I ran, then I ran the overhead projector. Anybody remember, remember those? Okay. Then I was an usher. I was on the worship team. I joined student leadership. I grew up in a great church. And being part of a great church is, is one of the best gifts that parents can give their children. It's one of the best gifts my parents gave me. It wasn't a perfect church, but man, it really made room for young people to step up. And so I see a lot of that around here at Brave, where on any given Sunday, you'll find students serving and running stuff. So when college came around, this is where I was at. I was trying to decide, what do I do? I felt this tension between these two directions. I was considering going to Sac State for a business degree. I also considered doing a ministry internship program or even going to Bible college. But the problem was, and here's where I got stuck, is I was so stressed. I was wrecked with worry. I was worried because I felt like if I made the wrong decision, it could somehow mess up God's plan for my life. What should have been this exciting, like choose your own adventure moment was turning into a burdensome situation. And I was starting to feel trapped. Have you ever seen worry or anxiety turn something good into something bad? Like the opportunity to take on a new role at work or the opportunity to choose a college or to choose a house or to choose a spouse. Entering, or maybe you're entering a stage of life like becoming a grandparent or a super senior. Hey, we love our super seniors around here. You know, at every transition point in life, we have new opportunities. And so maybe it's a big transition or something big that you're facing that is then starting to kind of turn into some worries and maybe some anxieties, or maybe it's even something smaller. Um, if you're my wife, it's what's for dinner. Like, don't make her choose, you choose, right? Like, one of the best ways I love my wife is deciding what we're eating because she hates to think about that. Has worrying ever created a gap in your life that turns something positive into a negative? Uh, you know, in my situation, I had options before me. I had an opportunity that not everyone has. I had parents who were ready to support me and help me regardless of what I chose. Not everyone has that. My parents and my grandparents, they were willing to help pay for my school. Not everyone has that. Somehow my very first world problems were not just keeping me from moving forward, but I was losing perspective. I wasn't seeing my situation and being filled with gratitude for the people who were loving and supporting me that had sacrificed to give me so much. I needed help. I needed to learn to let worry work for you. That's the title of today's talk, Let Worry Work For You. Turn to somebody that you're watching with and just say, hey, let worry work for you. Let it work for you. In our passage today, Jesus, he's talking to a group of people and he's teaching them about God and about what it means to follow him. But they've got some questions. They've got some big questions about how to live out their faith. In this passage, Jesus, he answers a really important question, okay? 
Here it is. If I choose God as my master, and if I place my value and my worth and my source of security in heaven, then who will take care of my needs down here on earth? See, see, maybe you've wondered how God is gonna meet some of your needs. And maybe you've gotten some good Christian cliche advice like, hey, don't worry, God's got this. Just have faith over fear. Too blessed to be stressed. Or how about this one? God will never give you more than you can handle. How many of you have figured out that one's not true, right? Life often gives us more than we can handle. God's promise, though, is to be with us. So, so yeah, 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 we, we've got the t-shirt, we've, we've seen the bumper sticker, we've got the coffee mug, we've reposted the quote, but let's be real. What about my needs? Because they're real too, and I'm really feeling this stuff, right? God, what if I choose the wrong thing? God, what are you gonna do to provide? God, what if, fill in the blank, what's in your gap? What are you worried about? Worry in the old English definition literally means to strangle or to choke. Worry and anxiety will choke the joy and the peace and the beauty right out of your life if you let it. Uh, picture with me for, some ex- for a few moments, some exciting life events, right? Some, some moments that we all know should be so joyful. Like picture uh, getting ready for college or planning a wedding, or having your first baby, or becoming a grandparent, or even retiring. Worry can take the joy of these moments and turn them into something else. Maybe you've seen worry keep you from feeling how you hope to feel. Worry and anxiety creates this this pattern where your mind starts to go down this trail of what ifs. Um, For example, let's just imagine for, for a moment that you're standing here with me. Okay, imagine um, you're standing here and we're talking and you're going to the pumpkin patch after this, okay? And let's just imagine uh, you're you're gonna get uh, some pumpkin pie, some ice cream, some caramel popcorn, caramel apple. You're gonna go on the little train ride thing. Like you're gonna have a great day. But then imagine you're standing here and I pull out this rubber band and I put it an inch away from your face. What are you thinking about now? Are you still thinking about the pumpkin patch? No, like you're completely distracted by this unexpected imminent threat of danger of this rubber band about to hit your face. (laughs) When worry or anxiety distracts us to the point where we can't be in the moment or think about other things, it can paralyze us. And this is where the enemy of your soul can really do some damage. So here's the good news, okay? We aren't the first followers of Jesus to deal with worry. Jesus' first followers, they had lots of worries. So let's take a look at worry according to Jesus. We're gonna be in Matthew 6, starting in verse 25. Are you guys ready? All right, let's read this. Uh, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? The biblical principle on worry is simple. Worry like a bird. See, see, birds might be concerned about something dangerous, like a cat coming along or something like that, but but they aren't worried about the change in the weather, and they're not worried about where they'll find their food. Do not worry is a command. Do not worry about the everyday things of life. The word used for worry here is the Greek word merinau, and it means to express intense concern or care for something. This is also used in an appropriate context for godly things, like being concerned for people's well-being. In English, we use the word concern. Concern is appropriate when it's directed towards the right things within healthy boundaries. This uh, can really help us do what's right, Uh, but this can also cross a line and become unhealthy when it becomes an anxiety about the everyday issues of life. See, being concerned about something isn't wrong, but when it becomes a misdirected worry, it becomes something else. 
In a common style of arguing from the lesser to the greater, also regularly used by the rabbis of Jesus' time, Jesus then asks a rhetorical question. He says, are you not much more valuable than they? And Jesus is saying, if God cares about the birds in the air and he feeds them and he cares for them, aren't you more valuable? Won't he take care of you? Humans are the crown and the ruler of God's creation and their needs will receive proper and appropriate attention from God. And so this is what Jesus is addressing here in Matthew 6. So what can we learn from this? When it comes to worry, uh, it can only do two things, okay? One, worry can weaken us. This is the negative side of worry. Or two, when redeemed, you can let worry work for you. Um, I'm actually tired of feeling beat up over this topic, to be honest. I mean, it's easy to just feel discouraged when we talk about worry because we all worry. But check this out. Today, I I wanna flip things around a bit and consider the positive side of worry. How can worry help us? Like, what if worry could be your point of breakthrough? Today, we're gonna look at three redeeming functions of worry. And if you're taking notes, you can write this first one down. Three redeeming functions functions of worry. The first one is that worry shows us where we place our trust. Uh, For some of you here today, you're not sure what you believe about God. You're not sure what you believe about Jesus. You're not sure what you believe about these scriptures, about the Bible. You're just checking things out. And we love that you're here. Hey, maybe you came to Orange Fest and you thought, hey, I think these are some good people. Maybe I'll come back. Wherever you're at on your faith journey, what we can all identify with is that we place our trust somewhere. Whether you place your trust in yourself, another God, the universe, or or maybe you think Elon Musk is gonna save us all and we'll, we'll find the meaning of life on Mars someday. We all trust in something. So what does, what worry does is really act like a symptom that we can trace back to see what we're trusting in. For followers of Jesus, if God is who he says he is, um, if you know how good and loving and kind and powerful God is, if we're clear on who God is, then that means you can let worry work for you. If you're willing to to, uh, do your part and to shape your life around his purposes, then then you get to say, I'm gonna rest because God's on this, okay? God's got me covered. So one of the things that that we should ask ourselves as, as followers of Jesus when we become overcome with worry or, or anxiety is not, not what if, right? That's what we do. We say, well, what if this or what if that? What if is never really a helpful question. It's who is, who is God? And what does that mean for me? Christian writer A.W. Tozer, he said this. He says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So the starting point for a follower of Jesus as we wrestle with our worries is to see them as a sign and then ask ourselves at this moment, who am I believing God to be? And how does God feel about me? Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that this fully applies for every extreme case where someone's dealing with you know, mental health issues or, or deeply rooted anxieties, but, but that doesn't mean that this won't help everyone. Okay, even if worry has reached an extreme anxiety in your life, meditating on the character of God and how much he cares about you or how faithful he's been in your past, looking back at all the ways that God has come through for you, big and small, can redeem the time. In a culture that has turned our struggles into idols, focusing on God rather than self is a radical act of worship. Let me just say that again. In a culture that has turned worshiping our struggles, idolizing them, focusing so much on our hardships, focusing on ourselves, right? Focusing on God instead is a radical act of worship. There's also another huge problem with choosing worry and anxiety as a lifestyle. And Jesus highlights this in verse 27. Quite simply, worry doesn't deliver. It doesn't help. Unless redeemed, worry is one of life's most useless acts Jesus says, who of you can add a single hour to their life through worry? The fact is, worry subtracts. 
unless it's a healthy concern. Now, just before uh, last week, a storm hit in the Bay Area. Uh, they actually called it an atmospheric river, okay, because the wind was moving so much water so fast. It was crazy, guys. One of the biggest storms I've seen in my life. Um, so just before this storm hit, I had this healthy worry, this concern about my broken gutter on the front of my house. Because I knew like, man, if this is really crazy, it could detach, like it could probably break off and shatter my windshield. We've got we've to fix this. So I called a friend and he fixed it because I'm terrible at fixing things, okay? I'm not handy at all. But the point is, Man, my, my concern kicking in, my worry, was a good thing because we got the problem solved before it led to an even bigger problem. Now, that's worry with boundaries, okay? That's worry working for you. Um, I didn't think about the cushions in the backyard, and, and those things are trashed, so you can't save them all. But healthy concern can be helpful, right? To an extent, worry cannot make me taller, like, can't make me shorter, Thank God. Worry can't make you smarter. It can't make you thinner, stronger, or strengthen your life in any way. In fact, what worry does is the opposite. Worry makes us weaker. One person said this, worry is like a rocking chair. It will give you something to do, but it won't get you anywhere. The only thing that worry changes is you. It can make you miserable, but it cannot change your situation. Worrying cannot change the past Worry cannot control the future. All worry does is make us anxious in the present. Worry doesn't help. Um, Nobel Prize winner in medicine, Dr. Alexis Carroll said, people who don't know how to fight worry die young. Corey Ten Boom said, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows. It empties today of its strength. So instead of being weakened by worry, we need to learn to let it work for us. Let worry work for you. Let it show you where or who or what you're trusting in and then consider what needs to change. When we give our worries more attention than they deserve, ironically, we're the ones who suffer, who suffer the most because we're losing time, time that could be spent on so many other things. See, according to Jesus, worry is wasted time. Worry doesn't reduce stress from today. It diminishes strength for tomorrow. Worry literally weakens us. It tires us out. I wonder, are you finding yourself exhausted day in and day out? What if you're worn out from worrying? The other day, I told my wife, Marcy, I said, you know, it's so weird. I'm getting enough sleep. I'm exercising. I'm eating well. I don't, I don't think I'm working too much, but I just feel tired, like tired on the inside. Well, when I was reading this passage this week, I realized that what was going on is, is, is I, was, I was worried about my trip to the dentist. <laughs> I was worried about some, some worst case scenarios that I was thinking about. I was worried about some you know, hypochondriac health issues that haven't even happened. I mean, I just wasn't trusting God with those things. And so I was spinning my wheels and it was wearing me out. It was exhausting. I had to stop and to think about where am I placing my trust? Let's continue reading verse 28. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow, is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all of these things. And your heavenly father knows what you need. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all of these things will be given to you as well. The next redeeming function of worry is this. Number two, worry helps us see what we value. It helps us see what we value. What are you concerned about? Some things are natural, right? Like maybe you're concerned about your kid's safety or concerned about your career or concerned about something that you need to get done. Remember, concern can be good. It can also show us something about our priorities. If we're concerned about all of these earthly things, to use Jesus' examples, things like clothes we wear or food that we eat, but we're not also concerned about our relationship with God and his kingdom, we might need to reevaluate. Matthew 6.33 is, is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I come back to it often 
because it's such a great priority filter. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. What Jesus isn't saying is seek first the kingdom and you'll get rich. Or seek first the kingdom and I'll be your personal genie and I'll grant you some wishes. No, he's saying if you seek first my kingdom and righteousness, all earthly possess, uh, provision will be taken care of. You won't have to worry about the basic needs of your life. I will provide them for you. Our God is the ultimate provider. But notice this is conditional upon something. This promise comes with a condition and it's conditional upon our priorities. As I was studying this week, you know, I had this thought. We live in the age of anxiety. It's common. It's, it's very normal. Everyone and their mom has anxiety disorders, okay? It's a pandemic. But as I realized this, I was reading this verse, you know, something just kind of popped into my mind. I've almost never had uh, someone say that they were experiencing anxiety over whether or not people are finding Jesus. There are plenty of church critics and there are also some who are genuinely concerned with the mission of God. But it's typically not a source of anxiety. See, Jesus knew that the things that we would struggle with would, for the most part, be self-focused. We stress about our lives, our families, our wants, our needs, our desires, and Jesus cares about those things. But when healthy concern turns to worry, Jesus offers us another way. Jesus says, be concerned about my kingdom." Seek first my kingdom and all of its righteousness and I'll take care of the rest. If you make Jesus your priority, he'll be your provider. Earlier, I mentioned the tension that I felt in choosing my path forward after high school. I remember being so worried that, that I was gonna choose the wrong thing and that if I did, it could just mess up God's plan for my life. Well, then a mentor came and he prayed for me. And God, man, he just spoke through me. Have you ever had someone come into your life at just the right time? And it's like God is just speaking through them exactly what you need to hear. He told me, hey, whether you study business, the Bible, or do an internship, whichever path you choose, you're gonna end up exactly where God wants you. It's just a, a different path to the same destination. This isn't a universal word, okay? Sometimes God does give people specific direction, but in my context, these were all good options that honored and valued the passions that God had given me. And so through this uncle figure and spiritual leader in my life, God affirmed the freedom that I had to choose. What mattered most wasn't making the perfect decision. It was the posture to value God's kingdom first. In all my worrying, I had turned a beautiful freedom into a heavy burden. I'm so glad that I had someone there to speak into my life and to affirm that if my heart was in the right place, I could let go of my worries and trust God. See, I think some of you listening today, you need to hear this. Stop trying to make the perfect decision or the right decision and be free. Enjoy this season. Enjoy what God is doing in your life and the doors that he's opening for you. Then choose, make a decision and trust him. Let's recap what are three ways, right? Three different ways that worry can be redeemed. Three functions. First, worry shows us where we place our trust. Second, worry helps us see what we value, right? Let worry work for you. Okay, worry can be a powerful audit for the heart. And it's also something more. Lastly, number three, worry can be an invitation to worship. Worry can be an invitation to worship. Just because worry is common, doesn't mean it has to be normal. Perhaps the area that you're worried about the most is the area that you're trusting God the least. I really believe that this is from God for, for some of you today listening that have been dealing with anxiety. Listen, God is inviting you to worship him. Worship is a powerful weapon. Not just songs we sing, not just in prayer, but in how we can take control of our thoughts and lay our idols at his feet. Our pain and our problems can become powerful testimonies, but they can also become idols. See, something that we give too much attention to or even start to find our value by identifying with, 
I think of my mom, she has multiple sclerosis and, and it can be all consuming, this condition, because it affects every aspect of her physical body. But you know what? She's not Tracy with multiple sclerosis. It's not even close to as imp- important about her as who she is in Christ. See, when we worship God, it releases the power of our idols. It sets us free. I wonder if if there are some worries that you woke up with or you came in with or have been weighing you down. Listen, be encouraged by these words from Jesus. This is what Jesus would say to you. Come to me, all who are weary, all who are burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I wonder if if there are some patterns of thinking that have been troubling your mind or possessions distracting you from what really matters or or some people who aren't a a good influence. Maybe you just feel stressed by their presence and, and, and it's just not good for your soul. Or maybe your pain has become an identity rather than a cross to bear that brings God glory. Maybe maybe you just need to put your phone down for a minute and make some room to connect with God. What keeps you from accepting the invitation to worship through your worry? Where do you need to trust God? Let worry work for you. Worship turns your point of worry into a breakthrough. And so Jesus, here he is with us, offering us another way. Do you want rest for your soul? One of the ways that we worship, that Jesus taught us as his followers to worship him is through communion. For many, this has become an empty ritual. But Brave Church, today, whether you're at home or you're on campus, listen, I want to invite you to experience communion as a worry-expelling act. Communion can redeem your worry. It's a sacred moment of worship where we're invited to meditate on the greatest news ever told. It's a practice that Jesus said to do often because he knew that we would forget. He knew the demands and the worries of life would distract and and, and even for the most mature followers of Jesus, keep us from the the life and the path that he offers. So, So if you're at home, hey, I just wanna encourage you, push pause for a minute Grab some some wine or some grape juice or some bread or, hey, if all you've got is coffee and donuts, that'll work too. But let's read 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 23, and let's prepare our hearts to practice communion. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You can take your bread and take eat. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Take drink. When you take this bread and you drink this wine, You're remembering and you're sharing in Christ's suffering. We think of what Jesus did for us. But a lot of times we forget this last part, to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. See, there there is a final restoration of this world to come where all wrongs will be made right, where all that has been destroyed will be restored. This is why we can stop worrying about our lives. This is why we can find rest in Jesus because the ending is good. It's already been decided. See, this life is so much bigger than us, yet we're invited into the story. Wherever you're at, if you join me, bow your heads, close your eyes. Let's have a moment with us and Jesus. Can I pray for you? God, I pray for each person that is tuning in, that is watching, that is gathering with us. God, I pray that they would bring their worries before you. They would see what you can do with our worries, what they can can reveal to us, what they can show us, but also, God, just this invitation to worship you, to lay them at your feet. God, I pray that people would find freedom from their worries today. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Thank you for tuning in today to another great message from Atmospheric Church. If this message is spoken to your heart, would you take a moment and share it with your friends? You can connect with us on Spotify, iTunes, Podcast, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Simply do a search for Atmosphere Church through these various platforms and then click the follow or subscribe button. If you're watching this video on YouTube, you should see it right below this video. It's another great way for us to be able to stay connected with you. If you live in the Southern California area, we would love to invite you to be part of our family. For more information about our church, go to our official webpage at atmosphere.church. Finally, if this service and our other resources bless you, would you consider giving back to Atmosphere Church to support not only these things, but also support the creation of even more resources for you? To make a donation, simply go to our website and click on the tab that says Give. Your gift of any amount is greatly appreciated. Until next time, we pray that you will keep the faith, spread the hope, and live the love.